Hey, welcome to Millsap Farm. Uh, this is a workshop that we're presenting uh, in partnership with Springfield Community Gardens and the USDA to uh, expand your understanding of community supported agriculture, specifically aimed at producers who might be looking at that possibility. And, uh, and we're going to cover some of the ways that works and, uh, and kind of things you might want to look for and things you're going to do, need to do well to run a good CSA. So that's the preface. Uh, meanwhile, I'm Curtis Millsap. This is Millsap Farm. Uh, welcome to the farm. Thanks for joining us today. We have a 20 acre farm here. Uh, on that 20 acres, we grow two and a half acres of vegetables. And that is the vast majority of our income. We primarily are vegetable growers. And most of those vegetables go out through CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. And we have about uh, 100, uh, 225 members this summer and usually about 75 or so members in the winter. And so that's, a, that's the majority of our produce. Uh, that's our staff is about eight to ten people. Depends, it's it varies seasonally, of course. And some of those are part time, some of those are full time. Uh, I've been here with my wife Sarah for 13 years. We bought the farm in 2007, and um, and then my farm manager Kimby has been with us for seven years as well. So we've got some experience, and we've got a good staff, and we've got a really nice piece of land, and all that is a good foundation for what we're going to talk about. So. Uh, as we talk about CSA today, Community Supported Agriculture, um, I'm going to touch on three important things that I think you should consider if you're considering doing a CSA or if you're already doing it and you want to kind of increase your game. Uh, first one is something I'm going to call the dread of the empty box, okay? This is this idea, this kind of psychological thing of what am I going to put in the box? I've pre-sold a whole bunch of vegetables and now every week I've got to fill their boxes and we'll come back to that. So first is the dread of the empty box. The second one is the economics of CSA. How, do the, how does CSA uh, affect the economics of the farm? And then uh, what sort of economic advantages or disadvantages are there for a membership as well? Uh, and then the third one is community supported agriculture. What does that mean for the community? What is the community, how does the community benefit? Uh, and how are we benefited by that community aspect? This is a little more touchy-feely, it's a little hard to quantify, but we'll dig into it a little bit and talk about uh, some examples of ways that's worked on our farm. So that's the preface. Um, I have, uh, I'll just jump right in here. The dread of the empty box. We started farming by opening, by having a CSA. Uh, we did a bunch of direct email marketing. Uh, we, we even uh, uh, had done, we've done a little bit of meat sales before that. So we had a little bit of a friends and, a friends and family email list. But we sent out a big email blast, which at that time, a big email blast was probably 100 to 150 people. And, uh, and we said, we would like to start a community supported agriculture program. And, uh, and we'd like you to, you know, we'd like you to meet with us and, and so we can explain what that is and then see if you want to join us. And, uh, and so that first February of 2007 or 2008, I can't remember for sure, uh, we had some people out for coffee and dessert and we said, here's what we're doing. Uh, you know, the CSA program will be a pre-purchased pre box. You'll get one box a week for 24 weeks from May to October. Actually, I actually think the first year we might have done April to October. And um, so six months at a time, we're going to ask you to buy in. Uh, these are the size shares we're going to offer. I think at that time we offered a $25 share and a $12 share. And that first meeting, we had two or three people sign up, uh, which is still amazing. I mean, what a, what a really... Uh, cool thing to have happen to us because we really were not ready to run this thing. I mean, honestly, we weren't quite there, but, uh, but they jumped in and were in it alongside of us. They then recruited through friends and family, uh, another 10 or 15 members. So we had at the beginning of the season, about 20 members or so. And that was a great way to start. We also did see a, a farmer's market that year. And, uh, and so through our farmer's market connections, we accumulated a few more memberships by the end of the season. And so that's how we got started. Well, right away with those 20 members, um, now I've got a commitment. You know, before that, uh, when we'd go to farmer's market or when we'd, because uh, we did a little preseason farmer's market and that sort of thing, when we did those sorts of things, it wasn't a big deal if we didn't have head lettuce this week or if the carrots needed another week to mature or the, the spinach had a hailstorm whack it. That wasn't that big a deal. But once CSA started, we now had 25 members and now 225 today who are expecting produce not just expecting it in terms of like oh i hope they have it but i've paid for this stuff it better be there now part of a csa agreement is always that it's a shared risk arrangement right 
And so, yes, uh, if we have a failure, people agree that as I understand that that's a possibility and that they may not get uh, all the vegetables that they had hoped to get, you know, variety wise or quantity wise. But uh, at the same time, you can't do that regularly. That's not what it means to be a CSA farmer. Uh, and so most CSA farmers I know live with a certain level of anxiety around this or certainly have for years. And so what that looks like, I always compare it to the school dream people have, right? So everybody has this dream, I'm sure, or maybe they don't, but I, maybe, maybe I'm the weirdo. But I think most people have this dream where you show up at school, you're not wearing your pants and you can't find your locker. It's, I mean, it's just straight up anxiety. I'm not ready is the message, right? Well, the CSA farmer equivalent of that is about four o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, I wander up through the greenhouse and I come out in the farm stand. There's all these people waiting for their vegetables. And I realize, oh my gosh, it's CSA day. And I forgot to plant the vegetables. Uh, and, and that's a really bad feeling. Uh, I used to have that dream, you know, a couple times a month. I'd wake up in a cold sweat going, oh, where am I going to get the vegetables? Um, so we're going to talk about how you drill down into that and, and address that and what we've specific steps we've taken on our farm to ease that anxiety. So the first one is a really good plan. And so, uh, so as you look behind me, this is so a plan is the process of having an idea and then executing that idea, right? So these strawberry, uh, sorry, cherry tomatoes had to get started back in January to look like they do now in July. And to start seeds in January, you have to have ordered seeds in December. And to order seeds in December, you have to have a pretty good idea of what you want to do that season. And so all that has to come down to a fair bit of time spent writing out a plan or typing it into an Excel spreadsheet or however you want to manage that. Um, but you have to have an idea of, in July, I would like to have this sets of, of products available to my CSA members. And to do that, if I'm trying to aim for 225 pints of cherry tomato every, every week in July, how many plants am I going to have to plant? And to get to that, how many seeds am I going to have to purchase? When am I going to have to plant those? And so on down the line. So come with me. Let's take a look at a little bit how that plays out here. All right. So here we are at the seedling table. And this is where about 70% of the plants on the farm start. We will take uh, seeds, soil, pots, soil blocker, uh, different kind of containers. We'll put all that together right here. And, uh, and this is the key to all of it. This is our seedling plan. And it's a, it's a spreadsheet. It's kind of hard to see it here in this light. Uh, but if you if you are really interested in this and you email me, there'll be a link at the bottom of this video uh, We'll be I'd be glad to email this to you or give you a link to it But basically what our spreadsheet has it has the, the type of vegetable the variety of that vegetable How many of those we're gonna grow when we're gonna plant them and when they're gonna get transplanted out so by plant I mean seed right and um, and those are the basic elements of the plant how many what variety how many of that variety when are they going to be seeded and when are they going to go out in the field? Now there's also other details in there like what size pot are we going to use? Um, are they going to be, some of them will be direct seeded out in the field. Some of them will be, most of them will go in pots here in the greenhouse. But all that is to say, we got this big plan that, that if we follow the plan, then when the time comes, those plants will be ready to go out in the field. We'll stick them out in the field. And if our timing is right and we take good care of them out in the field, then when the time is right to harvest, they'll be ready for that, right? So all these pieces don't just come together by accident. They come together because we plan for it and then we execute that plan. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll mention is, so we use a spreadsheet, like I said, I'm glad to share it with you. Um, I know people who do all this on pencil and paper. That's just fine, of course. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do this as long as you have those elements and as long as you carry them through. Um, now, uh, I've got a, a good friend who's an ex-Marine and a mechanic, and he says, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. He's absolutely right. Um, if you don't have a plan, then CSA marketing, CSA uh, farming will be an absolute failure for you because it is perhaps the most demanding form of filling a weekly schedule in terms of market farming. Maybe it's not, I don't know. I haven't done a lot of others, but I know that it is very demanding because as I say, every week, I've got 225 members who are going to show up expecting produce, whether I have it or not. So how do we, uh, how do we make this plan? 
Well, uh, several things I want to do when I think about this plan. One is I'm going to think about what do people want? Uh, now that's not as easy to sort out as you might think. So one of the things we used to do at the end of our seasons, we would grow what we thought people wanted, and then at the end of the, end of the season, we would put out a, a, uh, a survey. And we'd say, what did you get too much of, and what did you get too little of? And you know, the same items would show up on both lists. Onions were a favorite. About a third of the people would say, I didn't get nearly enough onions. I could use twice as many onions. And about a third of the people would say, way too many onions. I had way too many onions in my box. What that tells us is, Onions are popular and unpopular. How are we supposed to use that information? It seems so useless. Um, other products are a little more straightforward. Things like green beans, uh, tomatoes are pretty universally popular. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people who grow their own tomatoes during the season. And so some people may want tomatoes in May and June, but by the time July rolls around and even August, they've got their own in their garden. So they don't really want tomatoes at that point. Um, all this to say, planning for a CSA is not simple um, and it's, it's, it takes a lot of, of nuance, uh, and the goal is to give the people what they want, when they want it, and to have a little surplus, right? We don't want to run too tight a ship, because a too tight a ship means uh, the hailstorm shows up and wipes out your tomatoes for several weeks. Now you've got a shortage in your box. Um, but, but how do we do this? So let's, let's take a step back. The way we started our planning process was we went through the weeks of the season, and we said each week, we need to fill these boxes for this value. So I've got a 30, these days, I've got a $32 box, I've got a $17 box, and I've got a $10 box. I know approximately how many of those I'm gonna have. This is, um, this is me estimating from previous years, but I can also, I can just say I'm gonna sell this many boxes, that many boxes, and so on. So either way, however you wanna design that. But then you say, what is gonna go in that box each week of the season? So if I've got a 25, uh, um, $32 box, then I'm going to put in $5 of tomatoes, and I'm going to put $5 of carrots, and maybe I'll put in $5 of, uh, uh, of uh, green beans, and a, a couple of heads of lettuce, and whatever that is, I'm going to add all those amounts up, and I'm going to say, there's my $27. Now, I'm also going to add in an extra item because I like to have a little margin, right? So I'm going to add, a, I'm going to make that a, uh, sorry, I said 27, I mean $32 box. I'm going to go ahead and plan to have more like $36 worth of produce to go in that box, right? It gives me a little margin. And I'll do the same thing with all those, those uh, shares. And I'm gonna write this out. I'm gonna say, week one of the CSA, this is what I wanna put in the box. I'm gonna look at that in light of, I mean, I'm not gonna put tomatoes in my first week's box because they go out the first week of May. I'm gonna have to look at it seasonally. I'm gonna have to say I can do head lettuce and I can do spinach and carrots and, and green onions on that date. And then by the end of, end of May, I can start putting bulbing onions in. I may have my first cherry tomatoes out of the high tunnel and so on down the line. I'm gonna jot these things into a plan. It's a week by week plan. This is my harvest plan. This is my, my harvest and delivery, right? And I can quantify based on that. I could say, okay, I need to have uh, 75 pints of cherry tomatoes on the 7th of, of July. And then I work backwards from there, right? So we call this, you know, the end in mind, right? Uh, so we're we're starting with the end. We're saying this is what we, we're aiming for. If we want those, when do we need to plant them? And if we or transplant them, when do what sort of uh, conditions do they need? Do they need to be in a high tunnel or a greenhouse to hit that date, or can they be in the field? And then do we need to, if we're going to get them, if we're going to transplant them, for my example, the cherry tomatoes, we're going to put those in the ground in the middle of March. Clearly, they have to be in a greenhouse or a high tunnel. And I need to start those plants the second week of ja uh, January. So now I've got a lot more information, don't I? I now know I need to start planting cherry tomato seeds the second week of January so I can transplant on the 15th of March so I can have this many uh, pints of cherry tomatoes. Uh, yield numbers, I got a lot of my yield numbers early on from the Johnny's Seed Catalog. They're a really helpful catalog. They've got a lot of information about uh, what you can expect to yield from certain, you know, 100 foot row of this, 100 foot row of that. Of course, if you're a beginning grower, downgrade your expectations, right? Now you might want to plant twice as much, which is a pain because now you've got twice as much stuff to take care of. And so it depends on your experience level and your confidence, but uh, do be conservative, right? But that's where the plan originates. And so then, uh, so then we've got that idea. We got, well, these are the, this is how many cherry tomatoes we're going to need. And we're going to seed them on this date. And, uh, and so that's where all this data is generated comes from the far end over here, which is actually the harvest date, and it works backwards. Uh, and that, that is the, that's the essence 
at least the beginning of how you get rid of the fear of the empty box because you've done your homework. It's just like going to school and knowing I'm ready for this test. I have prepared. I don't personally know what that feels like, but I can imagine it. Uh, instead, I no longer have anxiety dreams about showing up at the farm stand uh, without having planted the vegetables uh, with enough years of experience to say, we're, we've got this, we've figured this system out, we've planned it out, and as long as we stick to the plan, we're gonna have enough food. Uh, obviously, every year brings its successes and failures, and so you've gotta work that into your plan a little bit too, and just be realistic that not you're not gonna get everything every year. Um, and so in our case, well, the way we deal with that is we create slack, and then we sell that through the farmer's market. And that works really well for us because at the farmer's market, it doesn't really matter from week to week whether we show up with 20 pounds of tomatoes or 200 pounds of tomatoes. We may not sell all 200 pounds of tomatoes, but we have a pretty good shot at that. And if we only show up with 20 pounds, that's, that's okay as well. Um, and that gives us the amount that we want for our, farmers, for our CSA and allows that farmer's market sort of to take the slack and be uh, a good way to market that. So that's, that's another way to think of this plan is if we plan for about 25% of our market to be something else, something that has that capacity to, to absorb that slack, then that's a nice way to plan as well. All right. So let's talk a little about economics. So we talked a little bit about the fear, the dread of the empty basket and how we, how we address that with a good plan and then executing that plan. Um, let's talk a little bit about the economic benefits both to the farm and to the consumer of a CSA. So this is often the, t the reason people see get interested in CSA, right? Because what other system allows you to be prepaid for your produce, whether you deliver it or not. And that's a pretty amazing system, right? Um, and, and so that is, in the essence, that kind of is the biggest advantage to, of the economic aspect of CSA, is that as a farmer, uh, once I sign up my membership, um, they have invested that money in the farm. Now, most of my members pay about 25% upfront, and then they pay 25, the second 25% the first time they pick up a share. So that means by the second week of May, I've got 50% of the produce that I'm gonna send out to the CSA that season paid for. That's fabulous because that means I have cash to pay for seeds, labor, fertilizer, fuel, all those things that I have to do in January, February, March, April, May that I would not have any income for until you know the second week of May when I start selling produce. Uh, that's wonderful. But, remember that dread of the empty basket thing? The other end of that is, I've now got people's money for something I haven't delivered to them yet. And this can be a really dicey thing. So we really have to pay attention um, that as we bring that money in, that's what that's for. It's to, be, it's to be spent on all the upfront costs. What it's not meant to do is basically to um, help you get further behind in paying your bills. And so what do I mean by that? So what I mean is, as you get these cash, big cash influxes, it's easy to think, oh, I'm, I've got lots of money in the bank, I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna do this thing or pay a little extra on this or whatever. Well, fine and good, as long as the rest of the season, you've got those expenses that have to be covered, covered, uh, with you know, the possibly that continual influx of, of smaller payments. Um, and that, that's, I don't know how else to say that other than just say, obviously it's a point of caution. You really have to be careful because it's easy to get out ahead of yourself. It's, it's easy to get out ahead of yourself and end up with uh, owing people produce that you don't necessarily have the money to grow anymore. So be careful with that. Uh, the second thing to think about on finances for farmers market uh, for a CSA is how are you going to organize those payments? Um, so now, you know, you go to the farmers market, that's easy. You go, they, you, you stand there with your table, people buy stuff, you walk home with cash, they walk home with produce. That cash is yours, free and clear, no concerns about that. Um, in, a, in a CSA model, some people are gonna come in and buy your whole share up front. So some people are gonna give me uh, a whole share this year, I believe is $720. Some people are gonna pay me that whole $720, which is $33 a week for 24 weeks. They're gonna give me that up front. So they've, got, they've paid for their whole share for the whole season. They don't owe me anything the rest of the year. Some people are gonna give me 25%, and then I'm gonna collect that second 25% on the first share, and then I'm gonna collect portions of that for the ongoing amount. Uh, in the past, we used to manage that with a spreadsheet, 
and sometimes we, what we would do would be a uh, we do a 25% up front 25% when you get your first share 25% uh, about now mid July or so and then 25% at the beginning of September uh, it has always been my practice and this is pretty typical in CSA farms to make sure that we are ahead of the customer we don't want to get to the point where the customer owes us money for vegetables we've already delivered them um, and the reason for that is uh, that leaves you in a really bad position as far as the ability to collect that bill, frankly. Um, and I have been stuck with some of those bills. I, I think I once wrote off $1,000 of produce that I had sent out, uh, not really realizing how far that person was behind on their payments. Uh, so that leads to the question, how do you manage those payments? Um, I've done that in three different ways. We've done it through uh, just an Excel spreadsheet on our bookkeeping system. That was horrible. If you're a better bookkeeper than me, maybe it'll work super for you. There are a lot of improved systems nowadays where you can set up payment plans and, and so on. So there's, maybe there's some nuances and improvements that'll help with that. But for us, that was a total, that was a, a really dangerous thing because it was often the case that in the hustle and bustle of the season, I would forget to collect the money. And then, you know, we get into September and now somebody owes you for uh, June, July and August vegetables. They owe you a lot of money. And you go to them now and say, oh, you know, I need you to pay me $250 for all the vegetables I've delivered to you. And they say, and I've had this conversation, they say, oh, those weren't really very good vegetables. <laughs> and you go, well, this isn't the time to bring that up. <laughs> but the truth is, you're pretty powerless at that point. And, and I'm just getting nitty gritty and, and being honest here. But, you know, people, um, there are those people who will go wade through hell and high water to make sure that they pay you, you know, above and beyond what they could possibly owe you. And there also are people who will say when you when they owe you money well i didn't like that anyway so you got to be careful with that and that's why i say it's really nice to to make sure that you uh, that you owe them vegetables rather than the other way around so the the excel spreadsheet was a problem the second thing was uh, uh, we used a program called small farm central there's others called farmigo um, I, there's actually several different versions of that online anymore but that's a really simple system it's nice the 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 uh, sign up of CSA members is handled through that and then they maintain the payment system as well and so all that you have to do is just check in regularly and make sure everybody's paying their bills and you get warning emails saying hey they haven't been paid for this member don't send them a share and then the final thing that we're doing now and this has really changed our system is we're using a program called Harvey and uh, Harvey works with that 25 25 and then remainder system and so it's all all the payments are handled automatically but Harvey also has some other interesting impacts and we'll, we may have time to get into a little bit of that. But I really like Harvey, it works really well for us. It's not cheap, it costs us 10% of our CSA sales. But uh, the big kick, the big, big, big thing on Harvey is it allows people to customize their shares, which means that they then have higher satisfaction rates, which means they come back year after year. And, uh, and plus they're happy. And that's a great segue into the third piece, which is community. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So let's talk a little bit about the community aspect of community supported agriculture. And uh, like I said earlier, this is one of those things that's a little bit hard to, to quantify. But frankly, if you're a farmer, you're used to having things that are hard to quantify, right? What does soil health look like in quantities? Uh, what does a healthy ecosystem look like quantitatively? Uh, we are used to already thinking in terms of qualitative stuff. And so when I talk about community, that's what I think of. It's really more about a qualitative uh, aspect. So for example, um, I like knowing who is going to eat my food. I think there's a lot of value to that for me personally. I like meeting those families and knowing that their kids and their grandkids or their parents are going to enjoy meals that were produced on my land, you know, by our hands, and that they got to see growing and in fact even participated in growing. Because one of the aspects of our CSA, and this isn't universal, but this is fairly common, is our CSA requires people to come out and work with us for 12 hours a season. Now that's not a huge requirement, right? It's got they have six months to do 12 hours of farm work. Um, and it's 12 person hours, so if two people come out, they only have to work for six hours. Or if they bring four people, only three hours, right? So it's a pretty minimal commitment. But what it means is they get their hands dirty. They actually work shoulder to shoulder with us. Um, they help us pull weeds, harvest the tomatoes, bunch and bag the carrots, whatever needs to be done. We have a wide variety of tasks to do, as every farm does. And, uh, but they come out and they actually experience what it takes to produce this food. 
And so when I talk about community supported agriculture, one way I mean supported is that they actually work alongside us. And another way I mean it is that they now know what it means to do this work. And so they are more supportive emotionally and more and um, and uh, in terms of morale as well. Right. So they're going to say, man, I know it's been hot out there. How are you guys doing? And it's not just uh, like, oh, yeah, it must be hot for you. It's actually I've been out there with you before in the heat. I know that's rough. How are you guys doing? I like having those conversations. I like my members knowing us and knowing what kind of uh, work we're doing and what kind of life we've led to get to this point and, and what this means to us. And I think that's a lot of the reason people want to join CSA uh, and, and surveys support that. Uh, people join CSA because they want to know where their food's coming from and they want to support local ecology, local economies and local families. And um, so that's the community aspect. Exactly what that looks like is different for every farm. So some farms have uh, no work aspect, but they'll have uh, maybe a couple of big gatherings a couple times a year out on the farm. Uh, some farms, uh, in fact, all CSA farms that I'm aware of have a pretty devoted news newsletter. So every week they send out something that says, this is what's going on on the farm, uh, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and one thing we've learned is it's really important to share all of that. They want to hear our triumphs, but they also want to hear our struggles because that's how they connect, right? Uh, if you hear somebody um, who, you know, it's always sunny on, on, on their side of the farm and you start to think this is a little more like an Instagram feed than it is like a true newsletter, right? Yeah, I, I don't wanna just see the shiny parts. I wanna understand uh, that, yeah, that last week, you know, we had uh, 97 degrees and, it, and we were all hot and sweaty and miserable and tempers were short, but we got through it, right? And, uh, and I also have found kind of along these lines, that there's some, uh, th I think the term people sometimes use is social capital, but this idea that there are times when you may need to lean on that community. Um, you may need to say in the case, one of the cases I can think of in our farm, uh, a few years back, uh, we had a big windstorm and we had several high tunnels blow down. We have 24,000 square feet of covered space. We have a lot of structures. Well, one of, uh, I think three of them actually blew down to the ground in this, this big windstorm. And uh, I put it out there in, in an email uh, to my CSA members that this has happened. I don't know how this is going to impact shares, but I want you to know that this is going on and that it is going to have an impact um, yet to be determined. And I don't think it wasn't really an, a plea for help. It was more just an information sharing. But lots of people emailed me right back and said, what can we do? How can we come help? Uh, people sent money, people came and helped alongside of us, helped clean up the mess, helped replant, care for plants that needed caring for. Um, all that stuff is stuff that, like I said, very hard to quantify. What is that? How, where does that exist? It's not in a bank account somewhere. It's not something you can say, put it on the ledger sheet. But it is something that uh, when you have it, it's maybe beyond value. You know, it's a pretty amazing thing. So, so that would be my, my other... Uh, thing I want to share about CSA is that you know while there's this economic benefit and there's a there's a big uh, amount of planning and execution required the biggest payoff to me is not so much the economics or maybe even that it makes you a better farmer but it is this connection to our community and so as you consider CSA or if you're already in that I encourage you just to, to dive deep into that you know write write newsletters uh, share your story you know make sure you're at the CSA pickup drop-off points so that you actually connect with your customers and they know who you are. Um, social media is a big thing anymore. You know, we try and tell our story on a regular basis on social media, let people know what's going on on the farm because they want to know. Um, they've bought into the farm, they want to know what's going on, and so we want to connect that with them. So all those things lead to this community aspect, and, uh, and so that again, that's that third element of CSA. All right, so we're gonna go now, real specific, the exact mechanics of how our CSA works. So. On Thursdays, Kimby, my farm manager, and I do a farm walk. And we go through the fields and we say, what is it that we could possibly harvest this week? And we'll make a list and say, uh, so for example, you know, we're going to say we, can, we could offer 150 bags of basil this week. We could probably do 225 summer squash. We can do uh, 35 bags of pea shoots, so on down the line, right? So we create this list and then we input that into Harvey, which for us is this, uh, this web-based program that's, that allows us to enter a harvest list, and then it takes that harvest, that estimated harvest list, and it sorts it out into hypothetical shares. Okay, so what that means is, I've got these 225 members who are gonna pick up, 
and they're going to get an email that says, based on your preferences, which they've already entered, they've already gone in the computer, uh, you know, as much as months ago, and said, we love arugula, we hate spinach, and so on down the line. Uh, they've entered that, and now the, Harvey is going to sort that out of their boxes. And so what that means is now they've got a box. So let's see here. Uh, Eric and Debbie won't mind me sharing. So Eric and Debbie Tarburton, uh, that's their share right there. And what that is is, as you see, kind of a wide variety of produce. That's what Harvey put in their box this week. Except they also have the option during the weekend, because we put that up on Friday, we, we farm walk on Thursday, we send out the harvest estimate on Friday, and then they have Saturday, Sunday to get in there and swap. So if they say, oh, you know, usually I really love tomatoes, but I'm growing tomatoes right now. And so I've got as many tomatoes as I can use. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna swap tomatoes out for salad greens. They can do that. It's a really cool system. And then that generates their actual share. So what I said was not entirely right. This is not just their email. This is actually the share that they then went ahead and, uh, and swapped in and out. And this is what they're actually gonna get today. You can also see down there, they've got flower share and fruit share at the bottom. And those are items that they've, that's share, extra shares that they've added to their, um, their base fr vegetable share. And we have options for people to add cheese, fruit, eggs, bread, uh, flowers, um, chicken and beef. Some of those are by us, some of those are by other farmers. The bread share is, is baked by two of my daughters. Uh, so there's a wide variety of things. We, what we like to do, we like the idea of people coming in here and basically doing their weekly shopping as much as that's feasible. Um, so, so we say, we start out with that harvest estimate, right? Now, Monday morning, 6 a.m., swapping is done. That's shut off. And I get an email that says, all right, your swap time has stopped. You can now print your pick list. I go in and print the pick list, or Kimby does, and this is what we get. So how many green tomatoes do we need? Well, we need, uh, uh, we're gonna need 14 pounds of green tomatoes. And we just, now this is simple, right? We have a, we have a pick list with the quantities, and uh, we go through that, work our way through that on Monday, and some of, some of it on Tuesday. And then, next step, uh, we saw earlier, and here's one of them uh, right here. Here's a box that's going up to a delivery in Bolivar. I'm going to cover their names. But uh, this is a delivery going to Bolivar. And this is a sticky, sticky uh, label, right? And so my computer is going to print these off. And now we're, we're slapping a label on a box. And then we're walking around this buffet aisle that my girls are setting up here. So this is Emma and Anna setting up the buffet. And so now as they want to pack a box or as uh, people come in to pack their boxes, they're going to go, I have green tomatoes or I don't have green tomatoes. They're going to take one. I have tomatoes, ripe tomatoes or not, and so on around the line. Uh, all based on what their preferences were and then what they swapped in or out for that week. So it's a pretty simple system at its root, right? Which is that we tell the computer what's available. The computer shares that with our members and, and inserts that, that element of preference, which is really powerful. And then we get the pick list based on that. And then they get a, a list that says this is what's in your box as they come and pick up. Uh, we had a question, I think, earlier about cut herbs. And I should say a word about that. Uh, cut herbs are a really valuable part of our CSA. A lot of our members really, really love that we can, they can get herbs that were literally harvested this morning in their share. And a wide variety. I mean, we have mints, cilantro, basil, dill, chives, sage, uh, Thai basil, parsley, multiple kinds, and so on down the line. Um, all that is really a valuable addition to the uh, to the CSA. You can also see we've got some peaches out here. We've got a fruit share that people pick up. We've got the bread share. Flowers aren't out here yet, but we've got flower bouquets that are part of their share. Uh, and then we've got eggs that are in the cooler here. We've got goat cheese. We've got, um, and the goat cheese and eggs are coming from other farmers, other local farmers. So this is a really cool idea too, that we get to participate in this local economy by sort of vetting other products and saying, hey, there's this really great goat cheese farm. If you want a piece of goat cheese every week, we can help arrange that for you and make sure it happens. Oh, here come our flowers. So the uh, flower bouquet, by the way, just a little segue here. I used to feel kind of guilty about raising flowers because I felt like we were sort of mercenaries. We were just doing it for the money. And then I realized that we we're actually growing happiness 
And that's a pretty noble thing. <laughs> it's not very many. Beets don't make people quite as happy as flowers do, as much as I love beets. So this is a good thing. Uh, so anyway, that's how this CSA works. Uh, our members come in, some of our members come to the farm and pick up. Some of our members get home delivery, and uh, that happens two times a week. And then we also have a pickup at the farmer's market. So there's, we've gone out of our way to make sure that we have the produce available to our members where they need it and when they can get it. So convenience is important. Uh, preference is important and those two things have really been uh, increased on our farm and our CSA by the Harvey program all right so all that said CSA is a great business model it's a great community model it's a great way to run a farm uh, there are definitely some challenges to it but from my perspective the benefits far outweigh the challenges so um, we're gonna my email my email is gonna be in this and uh, you're welcome to reach out don't expect a quick response, but I will respond, and I'm glad to answer questions and, and carry on uh, dialogue about how this works on our farm and ways you might need to, what, what you would like to do on your farm. Glad to help out in that way. So thanks for watching, and I hope it's been helpful.